Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Gregory Dalek, Chair of the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Michigan and today's moderator. I'm delighted to have you join us. Today, we are here to discuss the complex interplay between stress, sleep, and substance use. We will discuss the multidisciplinary approach U of M experts are taking in response to the mental health crisis in America and how emerging technologies can play a role in managing these risk factors. Thank you to everyone who sent in questions in advance for our experts to address. We'll also take some live questions after the panelists' presentations. If you're watching this live on Zoom, you can submit your questions at any time using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Our panelists are all leaders in their fields and dedicated to making a difference. And it is my pleasure to introduce them now. Joining us today are Dr. Helen Burgess, co-director of the Sleep and Circadian Research Laboratory and professor of psychiatry, Dr. Elizabeth Duval, assistant professor of psychiatry and adjunct assistant professor of psychology, Dr. Lara Coughlin, assistant professor of psychiatry and adjunct assistant professor of psychology, and Dr. Kathy Goldstein, clinical professor of neurology at the University of Michigan Sleep Disorder Center and faculty lead for Mobile Technologies Corps at the Eisenberg Family Depression Center. At this time, I'd like to give each of our panelists the opportunity to talk about their specific area of research, and following their presentations, we will begin the Q&A session. With that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Helen Burgess to discuss the topic of sleep. Thank you, Dr. Dalek. Um... It's really a pleasure to be here today, and I'm greatly looking forward to the interesting discussions that we're going to have about these topics. So yes, I'm Helen Burgess, and today I'll be talking about sleep and circadian rhythms. And oops, I'm sorry, could you go back to the previous slide? Um, so yes, in our lab, the Sleep and Circadian Research Lab, we research sleep and circadian rhythms in a variety of human clinical disorders. And we also create, test, and translate sleep and circadian research to improve health and well being. And you can see our lab website there, which I'll show on my last slide as well. Next slide, please. So I'll touch briefly on sleep here. I think we're all familiar that as we were younger, sleep really came quite easily to us. And as we age, sleep can become a bit more disrupted. Sleep is actually consists of various cycles during the night that you may be familiar with. So when we fall asleep, the, usually the first few bouts of sleep we have, you can see they're circled in red, a deep slow wave sleep. And this is very restorative for the body interspersed are these brief REM episodes, which become um, more predominant during the night. And you can see those circled in green there. Next slide, please. So when we think of sleep, we really think of it as a pillar of health. So it's up there along with activity or physical exercise, diet and nutrition in supporting our mental and our physical health. And we know that sleep disruption is associated with an increased risk for many different disorders. And I've listed just a few here. And these include heart disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, and obesity. We know that sleep disruption impairs our immune function. It can increase our risk for cancer and increases our risk of developing a chronic pain condition, depression, and a substance use disorder. Next slide, please. So what about the circadian system or what we sometimes call the body clock? Well, we usually think of this, this system as having three different components. And the first component is that central circadian clock in our brain, which you can see there in the middle. Now on the right in the green boxes, you can see all of the different rhythms that this central system controls. So it's regulating our hormones, which impact our hunger, for example, our stress levels our behaviors such as sleep and mood, our immune functioning. And we now also know, interestingly, that uh, in each cell in the human body is argued to believe, sorry, believed to have a little circadian clock. And these all come together at the level of the organ to help provide some timing control, but they are also greatly influenced by that central clock in the brain. 
So lastly, I would just highlight that uh, there are these what we might call external stimuli or input signals that can impact the timing of the clock. And you'll see light there and also exogenous melatonin. And today I'm going to talk mostly about light. Next slide, please. So light is actually the strongest signal that impacts the timing of the circadian clock. And in many ways, this makes sense because you can see on the left there that, of course, we live on a planet with a 24 hour light dark cycle, a very regular cycle that is impacting us. Now, on the right, you can see someone getting a good dose of morning light, and we now know that morning light is for most of us will be the most beneficial light that we receive every day. We know that morning light improves our mood, not just during the light exposure, but across the day. It can help improve your sleep later that night. And it also provides a very strong resetting signal to the circadian clock and helps us stay in synchrony with that external light dark cycle. Now on the bottom left, you can see that, of course, as humans, we're pretty good about messing up our light exposure. And many of us are probably getting a bit too much evening light, which increases circadian disruption. And then also many of us have a regular sleep schedules. And of course, we close our eyes when we sleep. So when we're sleeping at unusual or shifting times, that is also shifting our light exposure and that can feed back and disrupt the circadian system as well. Now in our lab, uh, some of the work we do looks at morning light treatment, and you can see one of our research assistants, Sonal down the bottom there, wearing a commercial available device called the Retimer, and this is what we use in our clinical trials to administer morning light treatment. Next slide, please. So coming back to our model in which sleep was a pillar of health, you can see that I've now added the circadian system as really a foundation of that house. It's influencing sleep, activity, and diet, and of course has profound effects on our mental and physical health. And today we'll be talking about stress, depression, and substance use, and certainly circadian disruption um, increases the risk for those. So just to wrap up here, some recent findings from our lab that sort of demonstrate these complex interaction between these systems. Uh, we've shown that insomniacs and night owls, so these are people with sleep and circadian disruption, are more likely to drink high levels of alcohol. We've also shown that heavy use of alcohol can actually impair the circadian or the body clock's response to light. And we've also shown that morning light treatment can help reduce traumatic stress symptoms. Next slide, please. So to wrap up here, in our lab, we truly believe that sleep and circadian research can help all humans thrive. And regardless of the underlying health condition, we believe that sleep and circadian treatments can help improve quality of life, and in some cases also help treat that underlying disease. So our um, lab website is there. Thank you very much. I'm now going to introduce Dr. Elizabeth Duval to talk about stress and anxiety. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Burgess. And it is a pleasure to be here today. Looking forward to talking with you all about stress and anxiety. So I'm an assistant professor and a clinical psychologist within our adult anxiety, anxiety disorders program here at Michigan Medicine. Next slide, please. And I work with a multidisciplinary team of faculty, staff, and trainees in one of the oldest anxiety programs in the country, dedicated to both studying and treating anxiety and stress disorders. My work has focused on understanding what happens in the brain when healthy adults experience anxiety and stress, what factors contribute to the development and maintenance of anxiety and stress disorders, and how to best provide treatments for these conditions. Next slide. So I'm here to talk about stress today, and we have a lot to be stressed about. The American Psychological Association has been conducting surveys on stress in America since 2007. And their most recent survey reports that the majority of, America, of Americans are stressed about things that feel outside of our personal control, 
like our nation's social and political climate, inflation, and violence. People with higher stress levels compared to those with lower stress levels were more likely to also feel overwhelmed, worried, have changes in their sleep, and turn to substances like alcohol and other drugs in an effort to relax. And this really highlights how prevalent feelings of stress are. While stress itself isn't considered a mental health problem, it can lead to or exacerbate physical and mental health conditions. Next slide. And we've all experienced stress or anxiety at some point. We know that stress and anxiety can impact us in many different ways. We can have physical symptoms like heart racing, sweating, muscle tension. Stress and anxiety can impact our thoughts. So we might think more negatively. We might expect bad things to happen or experience a racing mind. We may find ourselves engaging in certain behaviors in an attempt to feel better, but that might actually not be very helpful, like avoiding situations or tasks or using substances to cope. And chronic stress can contribute to some of our most common mental health conditions like anxiety, depression, and substance use disorders. Next slide. And at the same time, whenever we talk about stress, I think it's important to remember that stress is not always bad. Research has shown that there is actually an optimal level of stress where we perform at our best. Levels below this optimal range can sometimes be associated with a lack of motivation or carelessness. So if I don't worry at all about my grades, I'm probably not going to study for that big test. On the other side of the continuum, high levels of stress can be detrimental and really get in our way, make it hard for us to function and create a lot of other problems. And the research in my lab and others has identified specific regions of the brain that are relevant to our, our understanding of stress and anxiety. Next slide. We know that there are parts of the brain that function like an alarm. This alarm sets off a cascade of events known as the fight or flight response that results in a lot of the stress and anxiety related symptoms we just talked about, like racing heart or sweating. This is actually a really good thing because it keeps us safe. If I'm about to cross the street and I see a truck coming toward me, I want this alarm to activate, to help me recognize the danger and quickly get to safety. On the other hand, sometimes this alarm starts alerting us when it doesn't need to, or it activates more intensely than it needs to. And this can become unhelpful and lead to heightened levels of anxiety. Some research has actually found that people with anxiety disorders have an overactive alarm. Next slide. We also know that there are parts of the brain that serve as the voice of reason helping us to calibrate this alarm. Research has shown that these parts of the brain are sometimes less active in people with anxiety disorders. And many of our treatments for anxiety and stress disorders aim to try to help strengthen this voice of reason and recalibrate the alarm. Next slide. And in my lab, we're interested in understanding the intersections between anxiety and substance use. One of our recent studies looked at brain function in people with social anxiety, some of whom also engaged in risky drinking. And as you can see in the left graph, we found that people with social anxiety compared to those without social anxiety had trouble turning down parts of the brain that serve as the alarm when they were asked to ignore negative faces. We then looked at just the people with social anxiety. Some reported risky drinking while others did not. And the people with social anxiety and risky drinking had trouble turning down the alarm, as you can see in the middle graph, and also had trouble activating the voice of reason shown in the right graph compared to those with social anxiety who didn't report risky drinking. 
These are really exciting findings because they help us to pinpoint some of the specific brain-based mechanisms associated with anxiety and substance use. And our next steps are to work on finding more ways to target these areas of the brain using existing or new treatment approaches to help reduce symptoms. Next slide. And lastly, I'd just like to give a few links here where you can find more information and resources about anxiety and stress. So thank you so much for listening. And I would now like to introduce Dr. Lara Coughlin, who will tell us more about substance use. Hello, thank you so much for joining today. I'm thoroughly enjoying these presentations so far. My name is Lara Coughlin. I'm a clinical psychologist and assistant professor in psychiatry. I'm a part of the Addiction Center where we provide outreach, education, treatment, and research to minimize the negative consequences of substance use. I'm also a member of a brand new program, the Michigan Innovations in Addiction Care Through Research and Education, or MyAcre, which focuses on bold approaches to improving care for people who use substances. Today, I'm gonna to tell you about the current state of substance use in the United States and some of the most promising work being done to address the intersection of substance use and mental health conditions. Next slide. Substance use is the single top cause of preventable death. It kills more people than car crashes, suicide, and homicides combined. It's attributed to one out of every four deaths in America. So I'd like everyone to just take a moment right now to think, what type of substance is the cause of the majority of substance-related deaths? Is it alcohol, cannabis, opioids, tobacco? Next slide. The answer is tobacco by far. Opioids cause far too many overdose deaths. However, the immediacy of overdose overshadows the considerable more victims of other types of substance use, with 95,000 people dying annually from alcohol and an unimaginable 480,000 people dying each year from tobacco use. With that background and knowing that there really are multiple types of substance causing loss of life, let's talk a little bit about the root cause of why people use substances. Next slide. When we boil it down, people use substances for two reasons. To increase pleasant feelings like relaxation and sleep and to reduce aversive states like stress, anger, pain, improving sleep, improving wakefulness when you don't wanna be sleeping and reducing stress are motives that can drive substance use. Next slide. So how do sleep stress and substance use co-mingle? The answer is that it really goes both ways. When people feel stress or have trouble sleeping, it increases risk for substance use. But substance use does not generally improve someone's long-term ability to manage stress or sleep. In fact, it often makes things like stress and sleep worse over time. It's in part for this reason that about one in every two people with a substance use disorder also have a mental health condition. Stress, sleep, and broadly mental health conditions come up all the time with patients receiving substance use treatment. In fact, just the other day, a patient said to me, it was when I stopped drinking that I started sleeping. Next slide. However, only one in 10 of the 46 million people with a substance use disorder receive any substance use treatment. This is really one of the greatest treatment disparities in the entire healthcare field. There's this, we have this incredible opportunity to improve substance use outcomes through reaching the 90% of people with a substance use disorder who are currently receiving no care. The question is, how do we do this? Next slide. So here's a five point plan I believe is needed to make a meaningful difference. First, we need models of care that are easy to access, eliminating barriers that keep people from receiving care. Second, we need to make sure that people receive high quality care. 
far too much of our research and our clinics really exclude people who are in need of services the most. For example, people who use multiple types of substances or people with both mental health and substance use disorders. Third, we need treatment that is appealing to those we serve. It is not enough to build it if the patients are not interested or willing to engage in that which we build. This means listening to patients and ensuring we're providing the care they're willing to engage with. For example, incentive-based interventions that really reinforce behavior change for better health. A critical aspect of treatment being appealing and ensuring that treatment addresses the primary goals of the person. For many with substance use disorders, we're learning that managing stress, getting sleep, dealing with mental health conditions is their goal. Whereas addiction care oftentimes maintains a steadfast focus on abstinence, sometimes at the expense of supporting wellness. And finally, we need an unrelenting focus on addressing the deep stigma towards substance use and substance use disorders. Next slide. Myself and others within our center are doing work to directly improve addiction care. We're increasing access to care through telehealth, digital interventions, and other highly accessible modalities that Dr. Goldstein will share in a few minutes. We're increasing quality of care by learning what drives high-risk substance use, such as combining opioids and stimulants, to better include people who are really at the highest risk for overdose. In a program called Incentives to Quit, we're providing treatment that people want to engage with because it uses the carrot instead of the stick, and it more than doubles successful treatment outcomes. And we're acknowledging that many people don't want to stop use altogether, but no one wants to experience the detrimental impacts of a substance use disorder. Nowhere is this more true than in cannabis use. Thus, we are really working to develop treatments to match the goals of people and to provide what they're interested and willing to work towards, even if abstinence isn't always the current goalpost. Next slide. Finally, stigma is pervasive in the way that we think about addiction. The way treatment is delivered and is a barrier in the shame that people who are suffering feel about acknowledging their substance use. Here, you can really help make mindful language choices and recognize that words have power. The shift from using deficit-based language, such as calling someone a drug addict or an alcoholic, to person-first, strength-based language, such as a person with a substance use disorder, demonstrates that people have a treatable condition and their disorder does not need to define them. Next slide. Thank you so much for your time. And now I'd like to introduce my colleague, Dr. Goldstein, to tell you about the use of technologies in psychiatry. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm Dr. Kathy Goldstein. I'm a neurologist in the Sleep Disorders Center. Next slide. So you might be wondering what on earth a sleep neurologist is doing on this panel, but the Eisenberg Family Depression Center has developed research cores, and the goal of these research cores is really to support innovative data-driven research to transform the care of mood disorders. And one of those cores is the Mobile Technologies Core, and I'm the faculty lead. And our goal is really to create capacity for high impact interdisciplinary studies that utilize mobile technologies. And what we really want is to make this research rigorous, reproducible, and efficient. And equity is very important to us. We want both all investigators at University of Michigan who want to incorporate mobile technologies into their research to have the ability to do so, and any potential participants that want to be involved, we'd like them to have the opportunity to be involved in this type of research. Next slide. So what are mobile technologies? So you're probably well aware, we have lots of wearables available to us, smartwatches, fitness trackers, rings, even headbands, 
earbuds that collect data, and continuous glucose monitors. There's devices we call mirables that are mobile tech that we don't wear on our person. For example, bedside radio frequency and sonar monitors to estimate our sleep, as well as under the mattress sensors. Connected scales and blood pressure cuffs are considered part of these technologies and the mobile apps themselves. Your smartphone is used not only to deploy the mobile apps associated with wearables, mirables, or the apps themselves, but also your mobile phones have sensors, and those native sensors allow us to collect a lot of data passively. Next slide. So how could these tools help us in research? Well, if you look at mood disorders research in particular, what are the methodologies? So they were typically questionnaire based, and there's a lot of problems with that that have limited our understanding. So these can only record a snapshot in time. You're sitting there filling out a packet of questionnaires in that moment of time. You're trying to recall how you felt a day ago, a week ago, a month ago. So there's something called recall bias. This is very burdensome for our research participants and patients. They only capture a single or specific context. And they might only measure one or a few parameters. These are self-report only. They're not measuring objective parameters. And it's really resource intensive to obtain all of this data through questionnaires. Now, when we look at techniques using wearables and mobile apps, this allows us to collect data longitudinally over days to years. And that data is collected in real time. You're not having to think back about your activity three weeks ago or your mood a month ago. The data collection is passive. There's a lot of parameters that are collected by these devices and apps that you don't even have to provide input to. And all of these signals are captured in multiple real world contexts because these devices are on our person almost at all times. Because of the ease and ubiquity and scope of use, wearables and mobile apps are collecting multiple dimensions of health simultaneously, which is really powerful. And those dimensions can be collected both subjectively or what you report to the device and objectively what the device is recording about your physiology. Because of the characteristics of mobile apps and wearable technologies, this allows for scalable research, large studies that are far reaching. Next slide. Now, my interest is sleep. So how could these tools really help us in sleep? Well, we have a big paradox in sleep medicine. And as you see, this individual is undergoing something called polysomnogram, which requires you're hooked up to a multitude of physiological sensors. It's in a sleep lab. Next slide. But where does 99.9% .9 of our sleep take place? It takes place in the home, not in the sleep laboratory. And sleep disorders and sleep disturbances, as everyone's well aware, they don't really exert their significant impact just due to one night of exposure, but multiple exposures chronically. So we really need longitudinal, easy to use tools to measure sleep in this way. Next slide. So what can these technologies tell us about our health and well-being? We'll use wearables that are worn on the wrist since that's the most commonly encountered device. They have a light on the back. And what that light does is it monitors our small blood vessel blood volume and changes in that blood volume because light is absorbed by blood to tell us information about our pulse and then derived cardiovascular measures. And these devices also collect motion activity activity, and that motion and heart rate signal can be monitored to estimate sleep and restfulness. These are also great tools for accurately estimating heart rate. Heart rate variability can tell you if you have atrial fibrillation are a great assessment 
and for activity and obviously the way you interact with your device and what you tell the device is very effectively captured and the most powerful aspect of these tools is because you're getting this day-to-day -day, night to night measurement we really can see patterns and trends next slide but what can't these devices tell us a lot so you have to be very careful for the oxygen readings from these devices please note that if the fda cleared medical pulse oximeter says your oxygen is 90 percent your true oxygen is anywhere between 86 and 94 percent that's the difference between an icu administer admission and being healthy and if you look at a device on your wrist it's a consumer device it's not medical there's hair interfering with the sensor we're going to have even more inaccurate readings the other thing is these devices cannot differentiate between non-moving restfulness and sleep very well and anyone that struggled with insomnia knows when you're trying to sleep at night, you might be laying very, very still and awake. The other thing, everyone is very excited about REM, deep sleep, and EEG arousals. These are all brainwave constructs. These are defined by EEG, so we're not getting the same estimation from heart rate and motion. And of course, how you feel, your readiness, your health comprehensively cannot be determined by a mobile technology. Next slide. But these really could be powerful tools for the future of research and healthcare. They're going to allow us to diagnose sleep and mental health disorders with patient specific longitudinal data, provide us with what we call digital phenotypes. Because of their access and connectivity, they're very good for integration into telehealth. I hope that we once we one day see a patient generated data health dashboard in our electronic health record. And these are going to allow us to really, really scale our long term research in diverse populations. Next slide. And most importantly, we all want interventions to feel better. And these are mobile app delivered interventions right here from University of Michigan. And I'm going to stop now and look forward to take your questions. Thank you to all of our panelists for joining us today. We really appreciate you taking time from your demanding schedules to share your work and ideas with us through these presentations. So now I'd like to invite our audience members to use the Q&A function on Zoom to submit questions. I know some of you have been doing that already. And please note that our presenters cannot give personal recommendations or specific health recommendations for individuals, but can provide more general advice. We'll now begin the Q&A portion of the webinar and we'll address as many of the previously submitted questions and live questions as time permits. Hope that you can bear with us as we do this. So let me start. Um, first question, aging brings a lot of stress related to grief, perhaps related to the loss of a spouse or friends and anticipatory grief. Also added stress about physical uh, wellness and mental decline impacts sleep as well. Are there any tips on managing these factors in order to reduce stress and improve sleep? Perhaps Dr. Goldstein, I'll ask you to start off. Yeah, well, I can address the sleep component of this. And we see lots of patients that are struggling with these stressors. And the first thing that's impacted is sleep. And one of the first adaptive mechanisms I see my patients take when they're having trouble sleeping, as they said, I really slept poorly last night. I was up, I was staring at the ceiling, I was worrying. So I'm gonna snooze that alarm and I'm gonna just wake up whenever, whenever I get up. And what we find is when people vary their wake up time, as you all learned from Helen Burgess's presentation on circadian rhythms and the effect of light and you're, you're asleep, you have your eyes closed. So changing your wake up time changes your light. That's really going to interfere with your sleep more. So the best thing you can do if you're having a stressor that's interfering with your sleep is to get up at the same time every day, regardless of the sleep quality the night before, because what you'll find that over the next coming days, this is going to improve your sleep and make sure you don't go into this downward spiral of insomnia. 
Great. Anybody else want to add a comment to that? Dr. Duval? I can speak a little bit about kind of the, the stress component of the question. You know, I think it's really normal to experience stress and to struggle when there are losses and, you know, you're dealing with challenges with your own health. And I think stress tends to come up when we feel like we don't have a lot of control over what's happening. And so sometimes strategies that can be helpful in, in kind of managing the stress is figuring out, you know, what aspects of the situation might you have some control over um, and taking steps to engage in those behaviors, um, as well as just seeking support, right? You know, leaning on family, friends, community, um, as you're working through some of the, the challenges that might be coming up around loss or uh, transitions. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, let me move to the second question. This might be one for Dr. Burgess and Dr. Coughlin. What studies have been done on prolonged marijuana use and what can we learn from them? And is it risky to use cannabis gummies as a sleep aid? Is this considered substance abuse? All right, well, I'll start with, with as Kathy said, tackling the sleep component of that question. Um, so this is an active area of research because of course, with so many states now having legalized cannabis, um, everyone is sort of wondering, well, what does this actually do to people's sleep? And just as we see with alcohol, we know a lot of people are using cannabis to help them with sleep issues. Uh, I would say right now where the field is at, we're thinking of cannabis as being somewhat similar to alcohol in that, yes, a lot of people are using it. And yes, it may help you fall asleep that little bit more quickly, but overall it does have potential to disturb your sleep and potentially over time, you can develop tolerance, which means that the same dose that you've been taking every night perhaps is no longer quite as effective. So people start increasing the dose. And then there's also the issue where sometimes when people stop taking it, whether they stop alcohol or cannabis, you can sometimes get what we call rebound insomnia, which is that the initial sleep issue reappears and can sometimes even be worse than it was initially. So that's from the sleep perspective, but I'll pass over to Dr. Coughlin for the substance use perspective. Thank you. That was great. Um, and we do see this, this is a great topic because this is coming up so much with increased legalization and uh, really decreasing perceptions of risk around cannabis use. So our team did do a, a pretty impactful study looking at long-term effects of cannabis use, um, specifically in people that were using cannabis in part to manage pain. And one thing that we found is that as people are using cannabis over the longer term, at least in part to manage pain, they were seeing, um, most people were experiencing some withdrawal symptoms from cannabis when they went a period without using cannabis. And sometimes that looked like anxiety or restlessness or difficulty sleeping. Um, and in particular, over this one over about two years, we saw that the increases in withdrawal symptoms were most common among younger people that were using cannabis. And I will echo what Dr. Burgess was saying that certainly um, one area where we see uh, increase in risk from cannabis use is when you find that you're needing to use more cannabis um, to get the same effects or you're starting to use it, um, maybe not just taking one gummy at night, but you're using it throughout the day or uh, using multiple different types, um, you're vaping cannabis and having gummies. Those are all those things that we would think might be increasing your risk for um, experiencing cannabis related consequences or a, or a cannabis use disorder. Thank you very much to both of you. For the best night's sleep, what is your recommendation regarding physical activity, working out, or alcohol consumption? Dr. Coughlin, I, Dr. Burgess, if you want to start, or Dr. Goldstein? I can go ahead and start with this one. So, you know, there's not many things that you can do to, like, substances you can take, supplements, et cetera, to really improve sleep with the exception of exercise. So increasing your physical activity is an absolutely phenomenal way to improve your sleep, specifically increase physical activity 
improves your slow wave sleep. And that is the stage of sleep that we find is very restorative and is most involved in memory and also clearance of toxins from the brain, we think occurs primarily in slow wave sleep. The other great thing about exercise is many times we're doing it outside. So that again goes back to Dr. Burgess's area. So you're getting light, which is going to strengthen your circuit circadian amplitude and tell your body the correct time to fall asleep and stay awake. And in regards to alcohol, alcohol can help people fall asleep, but we know that it makes it very difficult to remain asleep. And the time spent during wakefulness in the latter portions of the night can be double if you're consuming alcohol in the afternoon or evening. Any of our panelists want to add anything to that? I guess I would I would um, completely endorse what Dr. Goldstein said. It really is hard to find things that will have a significant, um, significantly improved sleep, and exercise is definitely up there. Um, usually, we recommend you don't exercise too close to going to bed because um, obviously exercise energizes us, and sometimes it can be more difficult to come down from that as we're trying to enter sleep. Um, but yeah, in general, exercise is great. And of course, um, we know it, it can also um, be a pretty effective antidepressant and potentially help some of these other issues that we've been talking about today. Thank you. We'll go to our next question. Can you highlight real resources for treatment that people can actually use, especially for folks with no ability to pay for care? That's a, an important question, um, always, but particularly nowadays. Um, yeah, so I can speak to some of the resources, um, at least with respect to managing stress and anxiety. Um, so our psychiatry department's anxiety program website actually has a page, it's called educational resources, and there's a lot of information on there that includes um, some self-help resources. Um, we have recorded exercises, so like mindfulness, meditation, relaxation exercises, and we also provide um, resources in the form of like workbooks and handouts that we actually use in some of our um, anxiety treatment groups. And so that is available to the public and people are welcome to take a look at those resources and, and utilize them. Um, the Anxiety and Depression Association of America also offers free webinars. They recommend some self-help books and they also describe different treatment apps. So you can download apps on your phone that help you with managing different types of symptoms. Uh, many of those are also free. Um, and then lastly, you can also find some options for free and low cost treatment through local community mental health services. So michigan.gov or washtenaw.gov. Um, have more information about how to access those services. Great, thank you. And we'll, uh, if, if they're not in the chat already, we'll try and make sure that those links get uploaded into the chat for folks to be able to, to take with them. Okay, I'll move to the next question. Uh, what does morning light treatment look like? How long, how many minutes, and how many days? And does it work for other disorders besides PTSD? Yeah, so um, I guess what research tells us is light as short as about 15 minutes every morning can still have an impact on improving our mood. Um, the more light, the better. Um, in our research studies, we do morning light treatment for an hour every morning. So we look at the um, habitual wake up time of folks. Uh, whatever time they normally wake up and we either ask them to start the light treatment at that time or if they can't fit it into their morning schedule we say okay you can get up an hour earlier and fit it in that way if you're getting up an hour earlier you should be going to bed an hour earlier as well to make sure that you're not sleep depriving yourself during this process uh, in our clinical uh, trials we do this for four weeks um, really as sort of a maximum intervention. But yes, I would say any morning light is good, at least 15 minutes, and the more you can get, the better. 
And I think the second part of that question was other disorders. So yes, we looked at morning light treatment um, in people with PTSD and Dr. Duval actually helped us out with that study as well. Um, Dr. Goldstein and I just have a newly funded grant actually testing morning light treatment in people with inflammatory bowel disease. Um, we're testing to see if morning light treatment can help reduce inflammation in the gut, um, which there's pretty good evidence it could do. And we've also actually had some good success testing morning light treatment in people with chronic pain conditions as well. So th those are the main areas that we're exploring currently. Great, thank you. Uh, this one hits a little bit close to home. Education and practice in medicine involves enduring and functioning under with less sleep than would be ideal. Doctors are expected to be able to snap to functional alertness at a moment's notice and feel um, and feel that we can do so without difficulty. Is there a cost to this? Go ahead, Dr. Goldstein. <laughs> um, yes, there absolutely is. Um, we end up being sleep deprived, particularly during our training, um, just because of the amount of time it takes to train a physician. Um, when I did my training, we had an 80 hour work week. Um, this has been improved over time, but there has been some reverting um, to the longer work hours. Um, and then what the person who asked the question highlighted, which really isn't talked about enough in residency training is we're not just sleep deprived, but we're expected to function at circadian times where alertness is not being promoted. So when we look at our absolute nadir of alertness in most people, that's going to be around 4 a.m. And if that pager goes off at 4 a.m., you had to hop to it. You might have to put in a central line or make an important decision. And we haven't really found ways to mitigate this. Um, there's a lot of work going on, including here at the Depression Center. There's the intern health study, which contains thousands of medical interns, and it's trying to assess the effects of sleep, activity, and how those interact on mental health. Um, now, because of what we know about the circadian clock and because we can measure sleep and activity through wearables, there's mathematical modeling to provide input into residency schedules, but we're really at the infancy of this area. But I agree. I think it's being recognized that, that doctors can't be expected to be superhuman. Okay. Um, thank you very much. We'll go on to the next question. Are there significant problems caused by caffeine use? Or perhaps I should say, what significant problems can be caused by caffeine use? Uh, yes, um, ca and from a sleep perspective and actually a circadian rhythm perspective as well, um, we know that caffeine suppresses slow wave sleep. Um, and depressingly, <laughs> there are even studies showing that one cup of coffee in the morning will impact your slow wave sleep later that night. Um, I still consume some caffeine every morning, though, uh, but certainly the usual recommendation is no caffeine after lunchtime. Um, from a circadian point of view, it's interesting. There's also evidence that caffeine consumption, particularly in the afternoon, um, can actually shift the clock later and lead to some circadian disruption, uh, which we're trying to avoid. So for both of those reasons, I would say um, one or maybe two cups of coffee at the most, um, and really taking it earlier in the day. Great, thank you. Uh, are there ways to decrease the anxiety associated with cannabis withdrawal experienced by those with cannabis use disorder? That one, yeah, that's a, that's a great one. So the answer is that the cannabis withdrawal syndrome will sometimes produce anxiety for some people. And the good news is the withdrawal syndrome will actually go away after a week or two of not using cannabis. So what we recommend for people that are making changes to their cannabis use and, and experience withdrawal symptoms is really keeping in mind that this is a short-term experience and can help you to understand where your baseline is. And so some people will still find that they they need support. They, they may want to engage in anxiety-focused treatments, which Dr. Duval did a great job talking a little bit about, about those that are available, um, even after the withdrawal syndrome dissipates. But really, it can be helpful just to know that the withdrawal 
experiences people have, whether that's difficulty with sleep or anxiety, they will actually go away after a week or two of not using cannabis. So, so that can be just helpful to keep in mind that it's not something you have to live with forever. Great. Thank you. Um, this is sort of related. Are there any guidelines for non-risky use of alcohol as well as cannabis? Absolutely. So of course, the lowest risk option is not using. However, for many people, that is not what they want to do. And, and the thing about substance use is we get to make choices, right? And so um, the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism has risk level guidelines that they set out for, for alcohol use. They don't recommend having more than one drink if you're a female or two drinks if you're male um, a, a day. And so limiting the amount you drink. And I would say the other thing that is really helpful um, for both alcohol and cannabis is trying not to have your use be a daily thing. I was thinking about this when we were talking about um, alcohol and cannabis around around sleep is is if you're going to drink, make that choice to drink intentionally on the day or the evening that you're going to choose to do it, but don't have it be an everyday thing where then you run the risk of becoming needing that drink, needing that edible in order to get to sleep. So, so trying to minimize the days that you drink or use cannabis, trying to minimize the amount of alcohol or cannabis that you consume. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I'll do um, just a couple more questions. There's been some research work done on light. We've heard about that. Is there current research being done on noise? Yeah, I guess I'll start with that. Uh, there definitely is. And I think as Dr. Goldstein pointed out, the sleep field for the longest time was bringing people into the sleep lab and assessing them there. And of course, that misses everything that might be happening in their home environment, including noise. And uh, I think increasingly, we're starting to assess um, not only noise, but air pollution and a whole bunch of other factors and things that might be happening in that home environment. Uh, there certainly have been studies of noise and, and studies looking at people that live, for example, close to um, train lines um, or airports, and um, those findings tend to be a little bit mixed. Um, I do think this idea that you just kind of get used to it over time and the, and the noise does not impact you is not always quite the case. Um, but yes, as we're starting to study sleep, and other behaviors in the home environment, noise is, is one factor that we're starting to look at for sure. Great, thank you very much. Okay, as we wind down, I'll take uh, one last question. Uh, it seems like the university has so much money. If I wanted to make a difference or help one of these speakers, what does my small donation to an annual fund actually accomplish? I really appreciate that question. It does seem like uh, the university has uh, a fair bit of, of money, but I would say to you that a lot of that money is designated already to help support faculty and programs. And the importance of philanthropy and your contributions really can't be underestimated. You've heard all of our speakers talk about work that they are trying to initiate, innovate, and advance. And in order for them to compete for larger grants, they need to develop first pilot data, which shows some feasibility and promise to the work that they're contemplating. And if they make progress and develop a new treatment, that often occurs well in advance of when insurance companies and third-party payers will pay for that activity until enough evidence of efficacy is, is demonstrated. So our partners, our philanthropic partners, play a key role in, in providing seed money for the initial research and then for some demonstration of implementation and efficacy around innovative new treatments that then may go on to be the kinds of treatments that are implemented in your primary care office or your mental health specialist office and get reimbursed by insurance. So some of this is about supporting innovative ideas, allowing them to thrive and, and be nourished by the support until they can take off in larger grant funding or ultimately be implemented to the point that um, they're, they're part of healthcare and get reimbursed in that way. So I, we're very grateful for the participation of, of anyone who wants to partner with us uh, and would not underestimate the impact of, of that support in helping advance the kinds of innovative 
necessary research that you've heard about today. A number of our speakers have talked about challenges in access. Part of what um, many of the folks you've heard from and our department are driven to do is trying to figure out low cost, effective ways that are relatively easily accessible by large numbers of people, whether that's through wearables, through um, online uh, interventions, um, or things that they can implement with small amounts of effort and support in their homes to try and improve their overall mental health. So um, appreciate your interest and, and ability to support that to the extent that you are, but I would never underestimate the impact of that. Someone else want to make a comment? I'm sorry, I thought I heard a voice, but maybe it was just me. Okay, um, well, let me thank you all. Uh, first, thank all of our panelists for a really great discussion. I want to thank the members of our audience for joining us today and the numerous attendees um, uh, online as well, and as well as the thoughtful questions that were submitted. It really speaks volumes to the importance of the subject matter and the power of research to make our lives better. I want to thank our panelists for sharing their valuable time and expertise with us. Today's conversation for me has been very instructive and eye-opening and what um, it gives us a bit more insight about some of the amazing innovative research that we're doing at Michigan Medicine. I also want to thank uh, and extend our gratitude to the community of donors who support our efforts in so many ways. And thank you in advance for those who plan to support the Psychiatry Annual Fund that we linked in on the chat. Your gift to this fund will help support the kind of innovative multidisciplinary research focusing on some of the most pressing uh, health issues of our time. And we'll follow up with everybody uh, who registered today as well aware, with uh, today's well aware with an email on Monday, including a recording of the webinar so that you can watch it again or share it with friends and relatives and family. Please feel free to do so. Finally, I want to encourage all of you to visit the WellAware website to stay informed on our quarterly webinars. Thank you so much again for your participation and go blue.